This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline. Kyle Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. It is a new year, 2016 rolls in. The NBA continues to roll through. Exciting stuff happening, and you know I gotta talk about it in order to do that. I do it with my right-hand man, 50 Grand, NBA aficionado, Don Mac contributor, writer for one of the illest websites, www.shawsports.net, the big kahuna and PNC. My man, Mr. Warren Shaw, repping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Happy New Year's to you, my brother. Happy New Year's to you and Happy New Year's to all the fans, listeners of the Baseline. So salute. Hope everybody was safe and had an enjoyable holiday season. Didn't get too crazy on New Year's Eve and, you know, bringing the New Year right with us here on the Baseline. Yeah, man. And we have got an excellent show lined up for everyone uh, to peep out in a little bit. Uh, in our segment of The Breakdown, we have two, count them, two great guests uh, to talk about two exciting basketball teams. Our man Aaron Preen from Project Spurs will be talking about the San Antonio Spurs and we also have Mark Boyle who does radio play-by-play uh, for the Indiana Pacers. Two dynamic teams, all exceeding expectations we can't wait to get these guys on in a few moments to talk about what they're doing right and what they'll need to do to continue what they've been doing to move forward. Also in our segment of the drop New Year, New Year NBA Restitutions. You may call them resolutions but we call them restitutions we give you some insight or ideas or what we might think is going to happen in 2016 and of course we've got our coveted coast to coast where we discuss all of the stuff happening in the association my man shaw breaking it all down to the underground listen we appreciate everyone continually showing love and support for the baseline nba podcast be sure to get at my man shaw at shaw sports nba or get at me at game face lee but we always encourage you to get at the show's twitter handle at nba underscore the baseline hashtag up the baseline let us know who you are and what you're about available on all the major platforms available on itunes stitcher radio microsoft tune in and player fm Please download any one of those platforms and allow us to be your go-to resource discussing all things in the association. You know how we do, and you know how we like to set it off. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. Put you down to the bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA podcast. And this week, we have a really great guest on with us to help us discuss the uh, state of affairs with the Indiana Pacers, a team that I'm not sure people saw were coming on this strong, having a really impressive season. We have our man Mark Boyle. He is the radio play-by-play broadcaster for the Pacers. Mark, thanks for joining us this week on The Baseline. My pleasure. Mark, um, I know that at the beginning of this season, a lot of questions are going to be asked. What kind of team was Frank Vogel going to have to work with, um, even with the uh, you know with with Paul George coming back? So far from what you've seen from a little bit more than a quarter of this of, of this uh, season, what has impressed you most about what this Pacers team has done? And uh, what are you looking forward to, you know, a- under this next stretch of games as we start heading towards the All-Star break? I've been a little surprised and a little impressed by how smoothly the transition has gone. They were playing a more traditional style with Roy Hibbert and David West, and they decided to go in a different direction like many teams in the league are doing now. And I anticipated that, maybe there would be some sort of complications, and that's not been the case, which is not to say that there haven't been peaks and valleys. There have been. There have been good stretches. They were 11-2 and in November, for instance, and then they had a losing month in December. So they're like a lot of the teams in the East in that they show promise that they've had an issue with consistency. Uh, The thing I'm most surprised about, though, is that as far as the style of play is concerned, they've made a fairly seamless transition. When you talk about that style of play, one of the things that Vogel has been um, noted for, especially coming into the league, has been the defense. And that's, I think, a question that a lot of us had was a little bit concerned about, as you alluded to, losing a guy like West, losing a guy like Hibbert. Can you talk a little bit about how the defense has picked it up, even though they're running and having playing at a faster pace offensively? Well, that's one of the things I'm talking about when I say they've had issues with consistency. They've been good generally. They've been in the top five, six, or seven in defensive efficiency most of the season. However... There have been lulls or stretches where they've been just awful on the defensive end. They've given up over 120 points several times. Uh, They've allowed teams to shoot for high percentages. But on balance, it's been pretty good, particularly since that was an area of uncertainty. They do need to get a little bit more consistent, though, on the defensive end because they're giving up too many points too many nights to teams that just aren't that good offensively, for instance. uh, The other night, Milwaukee, which is pedestrian at best on the offensive end, hit them for 120. 
And there have been other games like that. Still, in the big picture, being in the top five, six, or seven in defensive efficiency, I think is pretty good when you're making such a transition. Mark Boyle joining us here. Be sure to catch him on Twitter, at Mark underscore J underscore Boyle. Mark, um, one of the things that I think has really stood out has been the play of Paul George. I mean, he was just on an absolute tear at the beginning of this season. And over the last week or so, it looks like he's definitely struggled, not just with his shot, but is, is you know, a little bit even more so, I think, um, in, in his confidence. And we saw just the other night where, I mean, he could not hit anything for the first three quarters. And then somehow the, the, the light switch flipped and he just went off in that fourth quarter to help the Pacers uh, with their victory. What is what is it that you're seeing about, uh, about Paul George um, that you are impressed with? And what is it that you feel like is important, especially for this stretch for him to kind of get himself back into that MVP groove that he was in the beginning of the season? Well, there's another example of what we were talking about before, consistency. He was absolutely brilliant in November. And you say he struggled for a week or so. Really, he struggled for about a month or so. Uh, His shot isn't going in. Uh, He's turning the ball over more than any forward in the entire league uh, and has had a career-high seven turnovers in three of the last nine games. So there have been issues, but on balance, he's been good too. And the game you referenced, the Detroit game on Saturday night, was a fantastic display. He struggled. He was 2 of 11 from the floor, and then he took the game over in the fourth quarter. Uh, It was a close game. It was a four-point game, and then George scored Indiana's last 21 points. He was hitting threes. He was driving to the goal. He was hitting free throws. He was taking care of the ball, much more reminiscent of what he was doing in November. So if he's consistent, then he's one of the top X, 5, 10, whatever, players in the NBA. And if the Pacers win at a high clip, then he would be, I think, a legitimate MVP candidate in any other season, although this season is looking like it's Curry's award again. That can change. Curry's had injury issues lately. So we'll see how that plays out. But the same thing is true for Paul as it is for the rest of the team. He needs to be more consistent because when he's on top of his game, he's absolutely brilliant. The theme of this definitely seems to be consistency. Another guy who has been a little bit inconsistent has been Monte Ellis. And kind of from your perspective, you're on the team on a day-to-day basis. What did you think about Ellis coming into the season? Did you think he was going to have to be that kind of number two behind Paul George? In terms of scoring right now, I guess he's a little bit behind C.J. Miles per se. But who is the true legitimate number two on this team behind Paul George? Well, nobody stands out. George is clearly number one, and in late-game situations, they'll go to him whenever possible. But beyond that, they have nice balance. You mentioned Miles, uh, Ellis. George Hill is right around that same number in terms of scoring. So they have other options. There's no guy that stands out as a clear number two, and I think they're okay with that. Ellis is just averaging a little over 13 a game, and that's the lowest scoring average for him since he was a rookie. But he's doing other things. He's doing a lot of ball handling. Uh, he's been pretty good at setting guys up for shots. He's still, I think, trying to adapt to this new mix. You know, we're getting close to the halfway point, so you would think that adaptation or that adjustment might be about to end, and maybe it will. And maybe they do need him to score more. Time will tell. But so far, he's fit in very well. Uh, He's a good teammate. Uh, It seems to be a real nice fit for all concerned. So while he's not scoring like he did in his Golden State days or Milwaukee or Dallas, he still fit in here very nicely. Radio play-by-play broadcaster Mark Boyle joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast talking Pacers basketball. Uh, Mark, you know, one of the things I think that was coming into this season also that we questioned about was where this team was going to be with their front court, especially with David West and with Roy Hibbert moving on. And now you have the combination of Ian Mahimi and this young phenom in Miles Turner, who just recently came off of injury. Looks like he is definitely someone to kind of keep our eye moving forward. Do you predict that Miles Turner is at some point going to find himself in the in in the midst of being a you know in in the competition of being a starter, do you think he can pull Mahimi's spot, or do you think that right now it's a good enough uh, situation for him to kind of learn from behind these guys, playing behind Allen, playing behind Mahimi and Hill? Well, eventually, I'm sure they see him as a starter. Although I don't think that's this year. He's only 19 years old, and Mahimi's playing very well. So, unless there's an injury or something unforeseen happens, I would anticipate that he would play off the bench for the rest of this season. He's getting good minutes. He's doing very well. They're very pleased with him. And I do think they see him as a central figure in the years ahead 
for now, though, I'm pretty sure the plan is to play him off of the bench unless there's an injury to one of the other big guys. So you talk about these big guys, too. You know, again, there, it has been kind of a rotation. And, you know, we played bigger at times. We played smaller at times. I think Miles and George have both played the four and different things like that. What have you seen from Jordan Hill that maybe that you didn't know about him coming into the, to this season? You know, a lot he's been maligned to some degree, not leading up to draft potential. I think we're way past that at this stage of his career. But has he been a good fit for this team in, in the front court position? Yes, yeah, very good. He's been the team's leading rebounder most of the season, and he's been really consistent. He doesn't have a great game and then a bad game. He's just about the same every night. And so that's valued in a situation where not everybody is consistent. He's, he's been a pro. Uh, he comes to work. He plays hard. He's got a real nice nose for the ball. He's an exceptional rebounder. And so he's been a good fit. Uh, and I'm not surprised, although when you don't see a guy that often, sometimes when you see him every day, you develop a new appreciation for him. And I think that's the case here. Uh, Frank Vogel mentioned about a month or so ago that he was – pleasantly surprised with the way Jordan Hill was playing, which isn't to say he didn't expect him to contribute. He did. But I think that he's been better than Frank thought. So that's been a plus. Uh, and when they do go big, they'll play him with Mahimi or LeVoy Allen with Mahimi. Uh, they have the flexibility to play big, although that's not their preferred style. Uh, they prefer to spread the floor and play with both George and Miles at the forward positions and then Mahimi in the middle. But they can go big because of guys like LeVoy Allen and Jordan Hill. Mark, the next stretch of games for the Indiana Pacers seem to be pretty crucial. 16 and 14 currently is their record. They've got the Heat, the Orlando Magic. Then they'll play a Pelicans team, which can be off and on uh, Houston Rockets. And, I mean, you can see quite clearly there's like a, a variety here in matchups. And I guess the fact that Vogel has that ability to go big or go small, he can adapt in, in, to these particular uh, different uh, matchup situations as they as they move forward. My question for you, though, is – when you look at this this Pacers team and, and right now where this team is, where they've started, what do you get the feel? Like, what do you think the pulse is when you go into the, you know, and, and you've seen the home crowds? What's the fanfare like? Are they really feeling confident about what this team has done so far? And, and they really see the big picture about this team really becoming something special if they continue to do positive things for this season? I think they're more pleased with, what they're seeing them excited about winning. I think they think they will win eventually, but this style of play has been very pleasing to fans and the Pacers have already had six sellouts, which by their standards is pretty high for this far into the season. So the fans are embracing the style. They don't seem too concerned about the inconsistencies. And it's interesting because the East to me is one team at the top and two teams at the bottom and then a bunch of other teams scrambling for the seven playoff spots, and they're all very similar, not necessarily in style of play, but if you look at teams like Boston or Detroit or Charlotte or the Pacers or whomever, there's a bunch of teams in that mix, and they've all had peaks and valleys. They've won four in a row here. They've lost three in a row there. They're almost all over 500, and then there's the wild card with Milwaukee, which has played so poorly in really a sort of surprising manner because they were – a playoff team last year and look to be better this year. Maybe they'll get into the hunt too. And that's what's interesting about it. There's no clear cut number two. You would think Chicago, maybe if Rose is healthy or Atlanta, which has started to play better lately, but there's no clear pecking order behind Cleveland. And I think the Pacers figure that they can get in at a high spot if they start to play with consistency, but I'm sure Boston and Detroit and Charlotte and some of these other teams feel the same way. So It'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. But as far as the reception and the fans are concerned, it's it's been a positive response. They, I think, have really enjoyed this style of play. So as you talked about this team and, you know, again, them struggling to find consistency and then, again, same thing, that they can be anywhere in this Eastern Conference. It does become a point now because Vogel can play so many different ways. Do you think he decides to maybe go in one direction like officially and say, this is what we're going to do for the rest of the, for the rest of the season or go then in turn, meaning maybe somebody else gets moved or they add a, add a piece or, or do you think this roster is pretty much set and they're going to ride out for the regular season with this? Well, Larry Bird's always willing to do things. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, they made that trade uh, because they thought they were a championship contender, the trade that brought uh, Evan Turner in from Philadelphia. So they'll do some things late in the season if they think that it's advantageous. But for now, I get the sense that they're happy with what they have. Uh, they're never content. That's not how Larry Bird operates. If he sees something that he thinks will make the team better, he wouldn't hesitate to do it. But at the same time, I think they're relatively pleased with what they have. So 
they like the flexibility. They like that they can play more than one style, and I think they'll continue to do that based on the opponent. Uh, and their overriding concern, though, still is consistency. They just haven't had it. Uh, and just when you think they're going to emerge as the leading challenger to Cleveland, which it looked like they would in November when they were 11-2, and two, then they have a losing month in December, and you think, well, they're no different than the other teams in this pack. So they're not content with where they are. I think they're relatively pleased with the progress, and it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't do anything with the roster, but I've seen enough of the way Larry Bird operates that I know he's always looking to make his team better. So if something's out there, I don't think he'd hesitate to do it. So as you talk about this team, and you know, before we let you get out of here too, you know, not, not necessarily having to make a move, who are the key contributors off the bench? Again, it's, he's playing, I think, is maybe nine deep right now or so. Is it guys like Stucky? Is it guys like Jordan Hill? Where, who are the guys who need to play well off the bench for this team every single night to be competitive? Well, this is probably the deepest team they've had, certainly in recent seasons, and maybe for many, many seasons. They'll bring Rodney Stuckey in off the bench, and let's just say that they go with their preferred starting lineup, which is Monte Ellis, George Hill, uh, C.J. Miles, Paul George, and Jan Mahimi, then that leaves Stuckey coming off of the bench. McCoy Allen is available. Miles Turner is available. They are looking for ways to get Glenn Robinson in there. Chase Buttinger has played every game but one, and coming off of the bench has done some good things. Uh, so they'll go nine or ten deep, and they're very confident with their depth. Most nights, their bench outscores the other team's bench. So they're not concerned with their depth, but at the same time, you know, you're looking at a team that's 19 and 14, and while that's fine, it's not great. So Larry Bird always is looking toward a championship. Now, we haven't seen the Pacers get one since he's been here. They've been in the conference finals multiple times, and he's always looking for that next opportunity to make his team better. At the moment, though, there's no urgency. There's no need to panic. They have a pretty deep bench. And they've played reasonably well, so there's no reason to think that they're not happy with these guys. That said, uh, Larry's not one to sit around. If there's something out there, he'll do it. He is the man, Mark Boyle. Be sure to check him out on Twitter, at Mark underscore J underscore Boyle. Radio play-by-play broadcaster broadcaster for the uh, Indiana Pacers. Mark, we really appreciate you hopping on, uh, helping us get better insight on the Indiana Pacers and their play so far this season. One final thought or one final question here. Has Paul George invited you to his hot tub book club? And if so, what book are you reading? Well, I don't talk about stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I feel that should be kept private, but you know the kind of guy I am. You can figure it out yourself. (laughs) Awesome stuff, Mark. Thanks for hopping on with us this week here on The Baseline. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir, man. Awesome stuff from our man, Mark Boyleshaw. I mean, <laughs> hey, if there's anybody who, who's, who's, you know, definitely on it, uh, if you are the radio play-by-play announcer for the Indiana Pacers, then you definitely have some insight on what's happening out there uh, with the Indiana Pacers team who clearly, clearly are doing their thing this year, man. Yeah, such a smart guy, just you know, has a pulse, as you say, uh, on this team and what's going on. I'm glad we were able to get him on. But, you know, we, we keep the show moving in the new year. We got a lot of a lot of things to talk about. So why don't you let them know what we got going on next? Oh, uh, Listen, man, we already have one great guest on. So now our second great guest who's going to be joining us to help us talk about a team who really has been flying under the radar probably for the last 20 years up until they start copping those titles. And then all of a sudden, everybody in the NBA gets all so tired of them. Yeah, it's that same old team, the San Antonio Spurs. And again, phenomenal job that they're doing, overshadowed by clearly this great regular season run so far by the Golden State Warriors. But let's not overlook what this team is doing. And to help us talk about why the San Antonio Spurs might be the best thing not being spoken of in the NBA, we got our man Aaron Preen. He is the host of Project Spurs. You can catch him at www.projectspurs.com. And they're also available on Twitter at Project Spurs. Aaron, thanks for joining us this week to talk about your San Antonio Spurs, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Aaron, man, there's, I mean, there's no refuting uh, the genius of Greg Popovich and the work uh, that R.C. Buford does year in and year out to put together an elite team that is always competitive in the Western Conference with this San Antonio Spurs. But I think what's so remarkable is just when everything is on the precipice about a team being great offensively, this Spurs team dials it back again and is now, once again, one of the best 
teams defensively. What has impressed you about what we're seeing so far from this Spurs team you know, outside of what everyone else keeps talking about with regards to the, Go the Golden State Warriors? You know, it's it, it's really a just this full-on team effort, and that's one thing that's always been a key factor in any Spurs defensive unit is that it's not just Tim Duncan or, in the past, Bruce Bowen or now Kawhi Leonard. It's it's everybody that's out there. I mean, obviously the the press is going to go to Kawhi Leonard and what he does and, of course, his tandem buddy of Danny Green and then uh, Tim Duncan down low and then what LaMarcus Aldridge has been able to surprisingly show everybody this season. But it's really just... If it's not starting five, it's the it's the guys that are off the bench. It's everybody that's working together, and they're the communication. And if you watch, you go back and you watch these games, and you watch a lot of these highlights, these defensive highlights. That the way the way the turn the team is just focused at where the ball is, wherever whoever the ball handler is, they're just focused completely on not just where that guy is going to go, but any opportunity he has to where he can get rid of that ball, whether it's driving to the lane, whether it's going to be uh, getting up a shot or passing it off to his teammate, they make life hell for that decision maker. And the thing about the Spurs defense is they're never about blocks and steals. I mean, when you think about Duncan and Kawhi, you think blocks and steals, especially with Kawhi, but they really just suffocate you. They make you get into the worst spots on the floor that you don't want to shoot, the the, the mo least efficient spots on the floor, and it's always late into the shot clock. They just strangle you, and then they go the other way and score on you. So when you talk about the defense, obviously this is what has been the strength of this team, you know, first in opponents points per game, first in defensive rating, and a whole slew of other stats on things here. But mm -hmm. one of the things that kind of shocked me um, – to begin to begin the season really was the kind of the play of Lamarcus Aldridge. Granted, he's played well on the defensive side, and I think that's from the team concept. But he hasn't really been there offensively, and we knew his numbers were going to take a dip. I think everybody knew mm -hmm. that coming across, coming into the system. But are you even a little bit surprised by how well the team has still played, even though Lamarcus Aldridge is having almost career low numbers since I think like his first, first or second year in the league? I actually think Lamarcus is playing pretty well, and he's uh, getting acclimated to this team a little bit quicker than I think most people were expecting. And he knew coming into this that there were things were going to take a step back. He he knew that he wasn't going to be the guy like he was in Portland with or before or after Damian Lillard showed up. He knew that the way this team is structured, that there were going to have to be some sacrifices. But he still is a focal part of what they do. And it's not – I'm not surprised about how so much as well he's doing, but I am a little bit surprised how this team has been able to – kind of develop. I mean, I was expecting them to come out of the gate really rusty. Uh, not so much as rusty, but just not functioning really well together. Low chemistry, you got some big pieces that you just added with Aldridge and David West. Of course, you, you moved some big pieces. And Pop is always a guy that preaches um, corporate knowledge. Excuse me. He, he, always, he always likes to have that... Uh, that continuous knowledge within the team. So now you got all these new pieces coming in. You have a lot of the old guard that shipped out. I was expecting things to get off to a rocky start. Here they are at 29 and six. They're on pace to smash their franchise record and regular season wins. And uh, they offensively still don't look as efficient as they could be. It's not just, oh, they can get a little bit better. I mean, they look like they have long stretches where they can go. Their offense is not always... Uh, in a consistent motion, they they kind of get bogged down. They kind of try to get a little bit too cute sometimes, and then sometimes they try to rely way too much on Leonard and and Aldridge, and then things kind of get clunky with how they can get other guys into the mix. But what's beautiful about trying to get a team like this when you're trying to get chemistry built up is that you have superstars you can rely on. You have Kawhi Leonard, who is phenomenal this season. Uh, LaMarcus Aldridge, of course, of course, always Tim Duncan. And now Tony Parker is looking like the Tony Parker of old and not old, old Tony Parker. He looks, uh, and that also as well, Manu Ginobili, both of these guys, these old guards have life back in their legs. Aaron Preen joining us here. He's the host of Project Spurs. Be sure to check out their Spurs cast. It's www.projectspurs.com. Aaron, I want to talk a little bit about what you just mentioned a moment ago with regards to the offensive fluency that this team seems to possess. And it's interesting because when you look at the just the basic numbers, 
you know, with what you were saying on how mm -hmm. at times this team could be jagged offensively, this team is still the eighth best scoring team in the NBA. What stands out more than anything, and you just alluded to how Tony Parker's kind of coming back to the Tony Parker, all-star Tony Parker, the catalyst Tony Parker that the Spurs clearly are going to need for championship runs like these, is that they are second in the NBA in assists per game. And it's amazing to me because it's not being facilitated primarily through Tony Parker because Tony Parker, you know, is still trying to get, I think, I, I, mm -hmm. I would say kind of get his legs back underneath him. I don't think he really has ever been the same even going back from last year. I think a lot of it is being funneled through the play of obviously Kawhi Leonard. But with that now, the symmetry with him and with LaMarcus Aldridge kind of brings back that dynamic that LaMarcus Aldridge was somewhat used to when he was playing in Portland. Talk a little bit about how important that's going to be in order to create that fluency that you just mentioned regarding the Spurs in their offensive game. Well, there's two really big things with the Spurs offense. Uh, it's that ball movement and the spacing and that, and Parker, he's never going to get back to what he used to be. I mean, he's just got way too much mileage on his legs, but if they need him to stay healthy, they need him to engage the offense to get it initiated. Same thing with Manu Ginobili that they get the, the offense clicking early as far as in early in the shot clock, they get the ball moving. They're not a seven second uh, or less team, but they get that ball moving around, around the floor. When you, you don't have the ability to get the ball driving down the lane to where you can get that your shooters from, uh, out and get their their looks. Then it's things are going to slow down for this team, and they really need Tony and Manu to stay healthy. That said, having guy like Lamarcus Aldridge and Tim Duncan, you know, two big guys who can battle down low, but also have reliable mid range shots. Aldridge he can shoot a little bit further than Tim can. Uh, that's that's huge because it's really a pick your poison kind of thing. And then with Leonard, Leonard is sort of your just your utility guy. He can do anything, anything you really ask him to. And he's showing new pieces of his game this season that we've never really seen before. Uh, just even as, as soon as last season, he was not someone you could really trust to kind of face up and drive, to go isolation and take a guy one-on-one. -on -one. He That was not his strength. Now his game has become so efficient. That first step, that it, it's so quick, it's, it's intelligent. There's no movement without purpose from Kawhi Leonard. And it's, I think what's, also, it's, what's great is that, it's that you can really put Leonard anywhere on the floor. You can ask him to control the offense. You can ask him to clean up. You can ask, you can ask him to just primarily just be off the ball just to be a spot-up shooter. You can ask him to do whatever you need him to do, and that really kind of gives the Spurs a lot of uh, maneuverability and options on offense. They don't have to go – they don't have to play one style of offense. They can match up and change whatever the situation calls for. So I love what you're saying there, you know, about the, the team in general and obviously with Kawhi specifically, but there are, there's still room for improvement, as you've alluded to, especially mm -hmm. on the offensive side of the basketball. And one of the things that I think has surprised me is Danny Green has not shot the ball one. You figure that would have been the opposite when you add a guy like LaMarcus Aldridge who can play inside, you know, inside, outside, and, and you know, can throw the ball out to Green for those easier shots. He's shooting on just 37% as we record yeah. the show. What's up with Danny Green? And, you know, where do you see him, you know, being able to get some better touches moving forward in the season? It's just one of those kind of – season long slumps you know you've seen some pretty prolific shooters in the past who've gone through some really long slumps ray allen has even had uh you know slumps that lasted for a pretty long time and uh with danny green i always i was kind of feeling well maybe that defenders are closing out on him a little bit more they're, they're forcing him off that line they're forcing him to pick up the ball maybe there's not as much space but when you you pay attention to the game and then you even go di diving into the advanced metrics He's actually more open than he has been in the past two seasons. He's just not making the shots. And, I, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a mental thing. It, it doesn't look like it's mechanical. But what's really important for Danny in order for him just to not to completely shut down is for him to continue to contribute on defense. He's actually defensively, and this also is a big part of the team defense, he is having one of his better defensive seasons and – Popovich is going to uh, still give him the green light to shoot because that's how these shooters are going to get out of it. You know, you shoot when you're making it, and then if you're not making it, you shoot so that way you can get back into that rhythm. And it's 
you know, I, I kept saying on the podcast, on the Spurs cast, that if we're still talking about this mid late January, then then we got some serious problems because the Spurs still need him to knock down those shots or to be you know a little bit more efficient than what he is in order to go deep against a team like Oklahoma City or Golden State. Aaron Preen joining us. Aaron, I I, I want to follow up with that because we know that the Spurs are very 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 seldomly will the Spurs do anything mid season. Um, right. And, and, and Greg Popovich is, I, you know, he's old school to me. I think he's a ride or die kind of guy. If he can't get these guys right by the time that the playoffs start, then he's just willing to accept it is what it is. But I'm just curious, given the way and the trends and how everything is, there is a window for this Spurs team to walk, you know, sneak in there and really be that proverbial favorite, so to speak, even with the kind of season that the, that the Golden State Warriors have going for them. Everyone is talking about how this Spurs team literally could be that one team that could be the, um, the 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 Warriors' Achilles heel. Do you see that if guys like Parker, guys like Green aren't really f- either fully healthy or just don't have it together as they start making extra? Can you see Popovich trying to pull the trigger and do something midseason? I think only if something drastic happens, like if uh, Parker goes down with an injury or they lose they lose a piece. Uh, of that team, but you're absolutely right. Pop is a ride or die kind of guy. He's he looks at the long haul. I, I see more of him as like a, a soccer manager, and he puts a lot of trust into his players, and you know, he builds up their confidence. He'll he'll jump on jump on them if he needs to, and then he'll build them right back up. But he's not a micro manager. He's going to let these guys go out there and play ball and. You know, he's going to let them work themselves out, you know, work themselves out of a slump. They're going to let the work to let the team figure out, you know, what they need to do in order to get better. And if they're healthy going into the break, I don't see this team pulling the trigger at all. And they're they're looking pretty good as far as the starters are definitely concerned. I mean, they've got the second best record in the NBA, and then their bench is looking. As strong, even with all the, the the latest changes, their bench is looking as strong as it has in recent years. See, I love what you're saying right there. You know, regarding the bench, because there's not some one guy who stands out and is just mm-hmm. like killing it off the bench. It's the Spurs system. You and everyone, the old joke around the NBA: you just plug them in, and they're going to figure it out. But who's been a bigger surprise for you, kind of towards the end of that bench? For, you know, and I have two guys that I'm going to mention here, and I know he hasn't played in every game, and either one of them have, but Jonathan Simmons. And Bob and Boban Marjanovic. Which one of those two guys has been a bigger impact and uh, kind of a surprise for you this first season? Uh well, I know the the fan base is really big on Boban right now, and mm-hmm. he's he's kind of setting, especially NBA Twitter ablaze. But uh, Jonathan Simmons is a guy that I've been really high on since the summer league. He's uh, he's a guy that he's been he bounced around in college a little bit. He he didn't have really just that killer instinct that drive and he had a lot of issues with decision making that kind of kept him out of the NBA and so he was able to build it up through the D League he wa- really took advantage of opportunity that was given to him by San Antonio and Las Vegas and in uh and I was saying that I would not be surprised if Simmons was able to find a way to crack into the lower end of the rotation a little bit further on into the season I wasn't expecting it by early December and He's somebody that was incredibly interesting to me because I actually see him as a long-term solution to the six-man spot after Manu Ginobili because he has a lot of similarities as far into his game. He's very aggressive. He knows how to get into the paint. He's a very talented passer, great floor vision, which is kind of odd for a guy at the two spot. Um, He's a willing defender. He's uh, a hard worker, and the coaches love him. Um, Now, he doesn't – you can only have – a guy like, you know, one guy like Manu Ginobili. And I think the only other person who's kind of come close to that just kind of pure chaos on the floor is James Harden. James Harden, obviously, a hell of a much better shooter. But, um, you know, that th- there's there's things in Simmons' game that if he can clean up just his decision-making and just that confidence. And obviously, uh, they ha- his shooting needs to improve, which they have the perfect guy in Chip England to help him out with that. But if he can just continue to build with that confidence and decision making, I think he's got a long future with San Antonio, definitely in the NBA, and he's in a perfect situation. You couldn't ask for a better situation for a guy like Simmons. 
Aaron Preen joining us here. He's the host of Project Spurs. Be able to catch them on Twitter at Project Spurs or go to the website www.projectspurs.com. Aaron, a couple questions before we uh, we let you get on through. Um, my thing is, and and, and 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 it's kind of interesting. You talked about Jonathan Simmons because I feel like he's a poor man's Kawhi Leonard with his athleticism and everything else. I think just comes down to practice technique and really the right mind uh, putting him in the right direction to execute. To, to the to the best of his playmaking abilities, which I think will happen in a few years' time frame. They just have to show the patience for it. But going back to what I'm what I'm thinking about is when I look at Kawhi Leonard, you know, a few years ago, Sean and I, we did a show where we were trying to capture the preview uh, of the, uh, you know, during the uh, training camp as the seasons began. I think it was the 2014 season. Um, and I think the big question coming in was, when is Pop going to unleash Kawhi Leonard because even Kawhi felt like he wanted to be unleashed and now he's like Ryback feed me more feed me more <laughs> I mean because right now the only player that I know that Pop is going to leave on the floor if he wants to be out there for 40 minutes or more if you really truly want to even though he doesn't is Kawhi Leonard and I, I wanted to kind of get what you felt from seeing that now because Clearly, man, Popovich is is clearly in tune with Kawhi. And to see Kawhi out there on the floor, just, you know, like he just is like he's like a battery. It's just absolutely amazing watching him work. And it's finally mm -hmm. great to see that he, they've unleashed him. Well, going back to kind of like what I said with Jonathan Simmons, you couldn't ask for a better uh, He couldn't have asked for a better position for him to be in in order to grow and for long-term success it's the same thing with Kawhi Leonard because he's got so much talent around him he's got this world-class head coach that is giving him all this room he's giving him he's like I want you to do this you need to focus on this this is he gives him uh past players to kind of model his game around Scottie Pippen being one of them and uh he gives Kawhi room to fail he gives him room to fail what you know? You got to get better at this. The only way you're going to be able to get better at this is if you you know you take your lumps. And when Kawhi came into the league, he was just straight up three and D guy. I mean, he did not have a reliable shot. He really did, had no offense outside of just kind of cleaning up and getting out on the break. And he was more known for his defensive uh, ability and his rebounding. Now he he added the shooting. He's added little pieces up to his game, and uh. That there's that aggression and there's a desire there, and it's been quite noted. I mean, Kawhi Leonard's a very quiet guy, but there's a just this desire to get better and to be the best. And he, we often joke in the Spurs fan base and in the Spurs media, we often joke that he's just a robot, and then just there's no emotion there whatsoever. But you watch his emotions, his reactions out on the floor. I mean, he yells, he he barks at the ref, barks at the officials. He's, he's, uh, you know, show, he just shows that passion out on the floor and then off the floor, he goes back to just being a robot. Hmm. So but before, it, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say, honestly, where Kawhi can go from here as far as where the peak of uh, his talent is going to go. I mean, he's only 24 years old. Well, before we move close on out here, you know, I think the, the conversation with Kawhi is something that we've all, you know, been we've been wondering to see, you know, what like we'll see how, when he was going to be unleashed. And I'm sure the Spurs fan base now kind of has their answer in terms of should they be comfortable with leaving the, the franchise in Kawhi's hand along with Lamarcus Aldridge? I think absolutely. I think, I, think, <laughs> I think we have our answer so far this season. But before we close out, you know, let's talk about the guy who the franchise hands has been in for, for forever now, Tim Duncan. Mm -hmm. And. What he's been able to do, obviously, his statistics are not anywhere near what the, what we're used to for seeing from Tim Duncan. But I, you know, as as a guy, as you see right now, you see a guy like Kobe Bryant, you know, on his farewell tour and all those things. And we know Duncan's really not for that fanfare. But is this the last ride here for for Tim Duncan and even Mono Ginobili as the Spurs try to make a final run of this NBA title here? I think if they win the title, I think you can see Tim and Manu just riding off into the sunset. But you know these. <sighs> The reason that Manu came back was because he was really close on deciding to retire, but he got really excited at the prospect of Lamarcus Aldridge being on the team. He's like, "Okay, well, let's. I'll give it another shot." He was excited that his team was just re, had, was revamped with energy and and now another All Star. And Tim Duncan, he says he's going to play until the wheels fall off, and I don't see any signs of that happening anytime soon. I mean, he's going to turn forty 
this April and he's playing less minutes. There's less responsibility on him. But when he's out there, he still looks like the same Tim Duncan we've seen for, you know, good, I don't know, what, last 50 years, it seems like. We can be honest, though. We know that Tim Duncan says that he plans to play this game and outlast Joey Crawford. So since Joey Crawford is planning <laughs> to retire, I think that he could put a little bit of a smile on his face because there's— One more season. <laughs> one, more, one more season because I know that he's been waiting. I'm sure—I I cannot wait. I hope that they televise that game that Joey Crawford has to ref— with with Tim Duncan because I want to see the stare down one last time. One last time, I want to see if Joey Crawford is going to actually try and out Mr. Big Fundamentals. <laughs> he is the man. Um, you can catch him. He is the host of Project Spurs at Project Spurs. Um, but he's also on Twitter as well too at P R E I N E P S. He is Aaron Preen. Aaron man. We appreciate you hopping on, and uh, we cannot wait to get you back on there so you can let us know the progress of, of your son and his construction business that he's planning to uh, to uh, start unfolding upon us, man. I, I, there's talk now that uh, he does the renovations of living rooms. Uh, yeah, right now, I th- I'm as long as he doesn't move to my TV, I'm all right, but I mean, I... I'm holding out. I'm hoping this old furniture can hold out just a little bit longer till he gets past his phase. And but uh, yeah, right now, as we've been doing this podcast, I've been hearing crashing off in the distance, and I'm just hoping I go out there and there's nothing broken. <laughs> <laughs> Preen, and, Preen and Sons Construction Company coming out there at, uh, in, in, in a place in, in a in a in a town near you out in San Antonio. But other than that, <laughs> we can just relish in the fact that we have one of the great hosts of uh, Talking Spurs Basketball in Aaron Preen. Aaron, man, we really appreciate appreciate you hopping on with us this week here on The Baseline. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. You're tuned to The Baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot-button topics of the NBA. And this was The Breakdown. Time now for The Drop. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, The Baseline NBA Podcast. First show of 2016, and we have already started it off with a bang, but before the New Year's, and as we enter into the New Year's, everyone's got a New Year's resolution. Everyone, you know, they want to trim down, they want to bling bling, they want to invest, they want to rekindle their romance for their favorite basketball team. Shaw, you and I, we've been doing the podcast for a few years. Around this time of the year, we always try to we do this, but we never tell people. This year, our resolution is is we are going to let people know what we think should be happening in 2016 with reference to the NBA. So I'm going to let you go ahead and spark it. What do you have as your New Year's restitutions for the NBA of 2016? Restitutions, resolution, more like predictions is kind of what I'm going to go with here, man. And I see a couple of things happening. I think you're going to see a few names get moved um, this actual season, not necessarily even the 2016 calendar year, but this season. Um, I think something's going on. I think something's ruined in Memphis um, with Zach Randolph. Um, you know, not that I'm one of these guys. I'm not bored doing half these sources. It's just a gut feeling and kind of looking how trends go. Um, I think Zach Randolph might be in ABC, start to get moved. I um, mentioned in trade rumors. I also think Al Jefferson in Charlotte, um, same thing. He just hasn't, obviously he's injured now. And if he can come back, um, before the trade deadline, I think he's another name that you're going to see potentially moved and 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 find on another team this this season because it just doesn't seem to be working for right now. Um, over there in Charlotte, and another guy that I kind of want to talk about too is obviously we're going to talk about this a little bit later too with with the situation with Jared Jack and the Brooklyn Nets, but. I think at that situation is going to affect Joe Johnson where he ends up in, in Brooklyn. I think that's a situation where you might see him be bought out and potentially end up on a team, you know, a contending team. Um, like I think Cal was even thinking maybe the Cavaliers or the LA Clippers, maybe the OKC Thunder. Um, uh-huh. I think those are three yes. names you definitely need to look out for potentially getting moved. Yeah, uh, look, I've been saying this. Um, Brooklyn, they started you know, the Tear It Down project by getting rid of Darren Williams. They clearly are, you know, at least for right now, they look like they want to keep Brooke Lopez. And Brooke Lopez looks like he wants to stay a Brooklyn Net. Joe Johnson just seems to be someone that's just absolutely lost in what Lionel Hollins is trying to get this team to do moving forward. And if you are, um, if you're the Brooklyn Nets, this is about as good as time as any now to really start entertaining offers to move Joe Johnson. And I got to be honest with you, and I know we're going to talk about this as part of my New Year's, uh, you know, prediction, restitution, um, and revolution, so to speak. But 
if you're the Oklahoma City Thunder and you have the opportunity to get a person like Joe Johnson, if you expect to come out of that Western Conference, you need a consistent guy that not only can you plug in to be, a, if not a starter, but even if you decide to come have him come off the bench, if he's just your rental for the rest of the season, he is a much better option than what you've been running through with Andre Roberson with Dion Waiters with Anthony Morrow no disrespect to those guys but you're talking about championship or bust with Kevin Durant and and Russell Westbrook and what you've been getting from Enos Cantor you really have to entertain the idea of making a bold move and I think bringing someone like a Joe Johnson to that franchise is about as bold a move as you can and can definitely catapult you into that conversation of being a legit contender for the Western Conference title. Well, I think the main thing for Brooklyn is is even going to be about just trying to get some assets. Obviously, they've traded a lot of their stuff away to the Boston Celtics, and they don't really have a draft pick coming up. So if they can trade Joe Johnson and you know maybe some, a couple of the guys, and maybe you can get a young talent of some sort that maybe someone's given up on, or you can get a second-round pick, you just need to start to gain some sort of assets to kind of build build, build this team because there's no sense in, in you know throwing Joe Johnson out there on a Brooklyn Nets team that has no chance of really doing much in the Eastern Conference. So definitely put him out there to a contending team. He's done right by the organization to come there. Has been relatively successful in Brooklyn. Do right by him and kind of get him out of there and get him in a winning situation. But even on opposite sides of the track, Shaw, we're talking about Billy King, who I really think has been on the hot seat as the GM, and Sam Presti, who a lot of people have been questioning about some of the moves that he's made up until last year when he made these big when he made these big um, trades and, and, and acquisitions to deepen this Oklahoma City Thunder team. I, I think that right now, as you look at this team constructed with Billy Donovan and with the expectations about what you want from this team moving forward, you can clearly look and see which guys are on it and which guys are not. And at some point, I think a veteran presence is what's going to help this team best, better teams than, uh, than them, like the San Antonio Spurs and Golden State Warriors. So I just think that if you're not going to show that ex or exercise that kind of patience, then definitely get something or get someone who I think has been in the game long enough and knows that he can definitely contribute. He doesn't have to be a big scorer. They already got big scores. But they need a solid presence and a go-to guy that can shoot the basketball consistently and with confidence. And that's something that the Thunder definitely don't have right now, which I'm sure they should really be entertaining that idea if Joe Johnson is available for the right price. Yeah, I mean, I think he makes a lot of sense for them. You know, I think even more so for, for the Brooklyn Nets. And I mean, sorry, for the LA Clippers because of that wing situation is, is pretty, pretty porous out there right now. And I don't know, maybe a trade for Lance Stevenson could even be involved if the Brooklyn Nets want to try to take that chance and bring Lance to make you dance back to his hometown of New York. I think those are situations where it just seems like those teams could use him and there's a there's a potential where um something could happen where it benefits Brooklyn as well. Yeah, definitely. All right, so I have actually, you know, I, you threw out a couple. I've got one major one, I got a one minor one. Add on to that point. Don't be don't don't be surprised, Shaw, if there may be some possible rumblings and talks of interest for Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose still, to me, has not shown the propensity to have that true Chicago love like he first had when he made his run to his MVP title. And I feel like if you are the Chicago Bulls, you cannot get this wrong. Because if you've got a team right now, even though they're the second best team in the Eastern Conference, you can clearly see that this team plays a lot better then Derek then uh, plays a lot better without Derek Rose in that lineup than having him in the lineup. And with it, it with that inclination, it's not to say that Derek Rose is not a solid basketball player. He's just not a superstar basketball player. But maybe the Chicago Bulls don't need a superstar basketball player. What they need is a guy that's going to come in there and they they don't have to they don't have to. Sp to, to spoon feed and rebuild back up the confidence level that they've invested in doing this over the last three, four years with, with, with Derrick Rose. And I think that if there's a great offer for a potentially good talent, maybe some draft picks, looks like this basketball team depth wise is going to be all right, especially with the emergence of Bobby Portis. You still got Dougie McBuckets. You've got Taj Gibson, who's now refound himself. This is a solid basketball team without Derrick Rose. And I think that uh, Fred Hoiberg has done an excellent job to get this team to believe in themselves. And now with a new butler that is holding down the mansion, I'm just saying, Derrick Rose being moved might not necessarily be a bad thing in Chicago, even though he be is beloved in Chicago. Well, you know, I, 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 I challenge that. I don't think he's beloved <laughs> at all. I think he's, you know, kind of in the middle where, you know, the fan base has grown weary of some of his comments and, you know, they're just growing weary of him not being able to play as much. But, 
when he plays well, people seem to jump right back on that bandwagon. He's owed a lot of money. Um, his contract does expire at the end of next season. So it is an interesting situation um, if they would be able to find somebody to, to take him on, per se. And I do agree that they have some depth. They think they know right now that Jimmy Butler is who they need to build around. But their contract situation is very, very unique. Joe Kim Noah is going to be a free agent. They're always talking about moving Todd Gibson and, you know, and some other guys as well, Joe Kim Noah. So it, we'll, we'll really need to see what happens. New here. York Knicks, Chicago. maybe. Yeah, I mean, uh, Derrick Rose is Derrick Rose is definitely a name um, that will command interest per se, but he hasn't played you know anywhere near his contract level. So that's where I'm concerned. Chicago may, may not may, may, may not be able to get uh, the the right price for them for what they feel Derrick Rose, their former MVP, holds. You're tuned to the baseline, Cali Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Our segment of the drop, New York. Re- I'm sorry, New Year's. Restitution, I'm so hung up on Derrick Rose possibly playing with the New York Knicks. I mean, woohoo. All right, anyway. So finally, my my New Year's restitution is is in the hoopla regarding the Golden State Warriors. As impressive a season as this Golden State Warriors team has shown. I think the one thing, and we had our man Aaron Preen on not just too long ago talk about, you know, what's been so impressive about this San Antonio Spurs team. And my New Year's restitution, Shaw, is, and I know this is going to sound very hard to believe because I love the Golden State Warriors. I love what this team comprises of. But I got to tell you, man, this team might not win the championship even if they were, even if they went as far as to eclipsing the Chicago uh, Bulls' 72 win regular season record. I don't know if this team is going to be good enough to win the championship. And I'll tell you why. This team. As impressive as they've been offensively in doing what very few teams in the NBA's um, um, uh, history has ever done, this team is not that solid defensively like they were a year ago. And that worries me because now you're starting to see Steph Curry experience some health issues break down. They're going to probably have to back him down. Klay Thompson, he is not playing that two way, uh, you know, defensive offensive player that we've come to talk about, you know, over the last couple of years. And, you know, maybe it's just somewhat of a down year. I, I don't know if it's it's more so just him kind of refining himself or deferring a little bit too much so, but I'm not seeing the aggressiveness. The only thing that I can take from what I'm seeing from this Warriors team to give them an inkling of them being the top team in the NBA is what Draymond Green is doing. But outside of that, Andre Iguodala has not played up to his defensive capabilities I just think across the board, this team has gotten by with the fact that they can score the ball at will. But there will come a point where you play against a team like the San Antonio Spurs that's going to lock you down and is going to force you to take tougher shots. And it means you're going to have to stop them. And I've been watching them play over the last couple of months, Shaw. Man, they've been letting teams run up the score on them. And and that's a concern for a team that we talked about last year that got them that title was the fact that they played really great defense. Well, the thing about Golden State is definitely from they were giving up more points playing a little slightly higher at a faster pace. Um, they, they're scoring more points. That's going to, you know, their opponent's points per game is definitely going to go up. But they're still sixth in the defensive rating. And if there's one thing that you can probably point that to right now, and maybe that is the difference between Steve Kerr and, and Luke Walton. And I guess when Kerr gets back, this is what, that will be the true test. Do you see their defense kind of take that, that ratchet, that notch up that we're looking for them for to be kind of repeat some of last year's success, I think we can judge them on that once Kerr gets back into the fold, which I guess he's coming back pretty soon. Um, and then we can see where they stand at defensively. But San Antonio, um, as a pick, is never uh, a bad uh, you know, a bad selection, especially when you're talking about what they've been doing. And as, obviously, as we broke them down a little bit earlier on the show, um, I love what San Antonio is going to be able to do, I think, in the Western Conference and make a great run at this thing. And I hope to God, somehow, some way, we do find that as a matchup somehow in the Western Conference Finals. Yeah, that would be just an absolute awesome you know, thing for us to entertain, and it would just be great. Well, Shaw, I don't have any party favors to to, 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 to throw out or, or anything like that. We don't have any balls dropping or balloons popping on our end. But hopefully this conversation that we had definitely gives some people to, uh, re- to, to smile about what to look forward to uh, come 2016 for the rest of the NBA season. I definitely think so. And, you know, before we get out of here with this segment, I'm going to say the one thing, the Orlando Magic, watch out. As long as they avoid the eight seed and not don't have to match up with the Cleveland Cavaliers in the first round, 
I think the Orlando Magic have a very good chance of upsetting somebody and actually advancing into the second round. Just like what they're being able to do. I think there's a very, very dangerous team with Scott Skiles and all the talent they have on that roster. The Orlando Magic are, are, are going to be one of my teams to watch in 2016. Whew, I'm telling you, man. You're on it, Shaw. You are definitely on it. I completely agree with you. Well, the ball doesn't drop on our segment here of the Baseline NBA podcast, but our segment definitely does. This is Kylie Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA podcast, and you've just been... Coast to coast. Coast to coast. Time now to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's rock. All right. The talk out in New York is there's a possible discussion on bringing Brandon Jennings from the Pistons to the New York Knicks, and there's also some talk, too, that the Knicks are interested in Tony Roten. Looks like um, even though Jose Calderon's been coming on as of late, Shaw, that the Knicks might not be satisfied with their point guard position. Yeah, Brandon Jennings is a guy who's been linked to the Knicks previously in years past, and there's some rumors going back and forth. I think Frank Isola said, oh, maybe this is not something that is actually going to happen, but um, it does make some sense, especially from the Detroit side, if they can get an asset for him one way or the other. Um, Jennings is a guy I think would thrive in New York, especially with their new system. They're not 100% married to the triangle. It could work, and Tony Rowan obviously being weighed by Philadelphia. Everyone, the joke is, like, do you want somebody that the Philadelphia 76ers weighed? But Rowan is a guy who can play and I think should, you know, get, get some get some interest from one of these teams out there in the NBA. Derrick Rose, Calspiracy Theory coming on. Anyway, also out in New York, unfortunate situation. Clee Anthony Early, uh, someone who's not, you know, there. he was their uh, second round uh, draft pick um, uh, a couple seasons ago. He was uh, caught in a serious situation, an altercation in which he got shot in the leg. Will miss six to eight weeks. Um, Shaw, again, you know, we talk about this situation with players and athletes being out in the, you know, out there in in amongst the common folks, so to speak. And this was just another situation, again, caught at the wrong time in the wrong place in the wrong situation. Yeah, he's just basically, he was marked, if you will, and, you know, got attacked and don't know the full details of that story. But unfortunately, he got shot and now that's going to derail his season. You know, even if he wasn't in a rotation guy for the Knicks, this means that he can't go down to the Westchester Knicks and get some run in the D-League because he's going to be having to rehab his leg. Again, whole unfortunate situation for him. Again, not to say that you can't go out, but you definitely need to make good choices out there for your young NBA player and young star. Uh, hopefully, if Anthony early gets his, you know, gets everything back together and we we'll see him back on the court. All right. Now, out in Charlotte, you know, I, I, for someone that we used to talk about, it, it, you know, as being one of those guys, man, we had high praise for, man. It, it's amazing how quickly things can turn around. Al Jefferson, who just fresh came off of a suspension uh, uh, for uh, violating the substance abuse policy for the NBA, now is out six to eight weeks with knee surgery. I mean, you talk about the rails falling off fast for Al Jefferson, who once was a cornerstone player for this Charlotte Hornets team. man. I mean, what do you do if you're Al Jefferson? What do you do if you're the Charlotte Hornets? Well, like I said, you know, we talked about it a little while ago. I think he's a name that you're going to see mentioned, uh, especially if he can get right before the All-Star break um, for the trade deadline. You might see him moved. Um, Jefferson is in a contract here, so he's going to want a chance to prove himself. And I don't know that the Hornets right now are going to be that situation where he's able, he's going to be able to do that. Funny to say because he has been kind of the pillar of their offense for the last couple of seasons. But coming into the year, we heard about Batum and, and Walker being the focal points of the offense, which kind of left us wondering where Al Jefferson would stand. Now we kind of know, and now he's having the knee surgery, so that's even setting things back a little bit further. I think Al Jefferson is going to be out of Charlotte before all the season. All uh, right. Now, out in Golden State, we talked about the Warriors a little bit, and we talked about how they may need Steve Kerr. Well, Steve Kerr clearly needs to sit the, the Golden State Warriors. So hopefully him being back on the bench soon means that they will be the most they'll be the greatest defensive team to ever play in the NBA, right? Well, I don't know about all that, but I definitely feel like, <laughs> you know, Steve Kerr is a guy who, um, you know, he misses his squad and I think the squad misses him as well. And Luke Walton's done a great job to this point now. The only thing I think that's going to be sad is if Kerr comes back, I don't know how that affects Luke Walton's ability to potentially coach the All-Star team of the Western Conference. So, um, you know, whatever it is, I mean, obviously you want to see Steve Kerr back out there and, and, and leading his Golden State Warriors team, you know, to a, a hopefully another successful run for them. Um, but one way or another, Luke Walton's going to have to take a step, take a seat back. Um, um, and that's going to be an important part of this. Situation. I really do hope, though, Luke Walton winds up, you know, getting a job and really showing people that he's a capable uh, basketball coach, kind of like Bruce Arians on him. Like, I, I just want to lo I'd love seeing that, man, because I just don't think he's getting enough credit for the job that he is doing 
with the Golden State Warriors, even though they really already have a great basketball team in place. All right, Shaw, we talked about our man, uh, Tim Duncan, and we got to talk about his arch nemesis, Joey Crawford. This is his final season, uh, calling texts, ejecting players, giving them the mean mug. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do, man, to be able to not see our man Joey C doing doing the rest of the NBA players dirty for another year after this. Yeah, it's going to be sad. You know, he's definitely one of the pillars, one of those guys you you know as a fan and someone who's, you know, watches the NBA. You know Joey Crawford's face as a referee. He's he just become synonymous with the league, kind of like Dick Pavetta, and he retired a season a couple of seasons ago as well. You just know Crawford as, as a guy and as a face, and when you see them out there. And, you know, one way or another, he's going to have that personality. Whether you love him or hate him, it is sad to see him go. He's put so much time and so much effort into the NBA and in the league situation. Um, you know, kudos to him and whatever the next phase of his career is going to be. All right, Sean, finally, I'm sure people who were watching the game the other night with the Brooklyn Nets, um, Jared Jack, a horrific uh, injury, turns out, and the reports have been confirmed that he has torn his ACL, so he will be out for the season. Major blow to Lana Holland's team as the Brooklyn Nets looked like they were trying to get things together on the offensive end. Now where do you go from here if you're Lana Holland's? Well, they're immediately going to go with Shane Larkin as a, as, a, as a starter, and Donald Sloan will back them up. I think you're going to see a timeshare from that situation uh, for the rest of the season. There's also rumors that they may go after a third point guard. Again, a guy like Tony Roten's name comes up because he's available. Um, they can apply for the, the traded player, sorry, the disabled player exception. Um, I think they have until January 15th to do that. So the Nets have some options here, but I think at this point, um, you know, it's just sad, you know, to see Jared Jack go. He was having a pretty nice season. Um, I think averaging a career high in his assists this year and was really just he's just one of the nice guys around the league just is very very well very well liked on his team and just in general you know Stephen Curry is one of his that's one of his best friends out there and it's just sad to see Jared Jack have his season end the way that yeah man really a shame uh, he did uh, uh, release a statement on Instagram uh, acknowledging fans and friends uh, with support uh, regarding injury I mean clearly this is not something where he will never be able to come back from it, but he was really having a great, great uh, season, really helping the Brooklyn Nets. I think he surprised me because I wasn't completely high on his his uh, ability to stay as a as a starting guard. But I think for that kind of offense and what Lionel Hollins needs to stabilize the young players that he has, he was doing an excellent job. So we wish Jarrett Jack, um, you know, uh, Godspeed and and recovery, uh, you know, to be able to get back on that basketball court to continue to do what he does. Awesome show this week, Shaw, man. So much happening. Um, what a way for us to kick off the New Year's with two really great guests giving two perspectives on two dynamic teams who are completely exceeding expectations that we had and uh, other analysts have had about them at the beginning of the season. Yeah, it's nice to be able to get knowledgeable people on at all times, especially when we can even kind of, you know, make it uh, – do, do it kind of in half, if you will, do an East Coast and a West Coast team. Um, and two great guests, you know, shout out to Mark Boyle and, and Anna Preen for coming on the show and really dropping the knowledge on, on their respective teams. Hope everybody enjoyed this week's show. First one of the new year. We're going to keep things moving forward in 2016. Um, and again, I enjoyed it doing with you, my man. Yeah, always, man. It was great, great, great. And once again, we would like to thank Aaron Preen from Projects, uh, from uh, Project Spurs uh, and also Mark Boyle, uh, play-by-play broadcaster, a radio broadcaster for the Indiana Pacers for joining us this week. And before we sign off, we didn't get an opportunity to do this as clearly it happened in between our show recordings. Uh, but the Baseline NBA podcast would like to extend uh, best wishes um, and condolences uh, to the to, to Meadowlark, uh, Meadowlark Lemon's family. Meadowlark uh, Lemon was just really one of the true pioneers and ambassadors of the game of basketball. I had an opportunity to talk about him on, um, on one of uh, on, on my people's uh, Maximus and Bartender on their show. And, uh, you know, it's just a shame that the NBA family, again, has lost another great player, uh, another great person who's, who uh, continued to help elevate the sport at a time when the sport needed elevation. And so, once again, we want to extend our condolences. A great player in Metal Arc Lemon and his loss uh, to the family. We wished him well, and uh, we, we were glad he was with us when he could be. So, for the baseline, Kyle Lee, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys. And we can't wait to catch up with you next time. <laughs>